Okay, so it's it's uh it's start time now, wherever that is for you, uh, but four o'clock here. So I think we'll we'll get started. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining us today for the inaugural Mind Voyage lecture, which is part of an ongoing series of thought-provoking and sometimes controversial. Uh, but always inspiring talks from people in different corners of science, whether it be neuroscience or humanities uh, or biology or physics. But today to kick things off, we're truly honored to have with us uh, Danny Gassett, who's joining us from the University of Pennsylvania, where they are the J. Peter Skirtanek Professor uh, with appointments in the Department of Bioengineering, Electrical and Systems Engineering and Physics and Astronomy, as well as Neurology and Psychiatry. They're also an external professor of the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, Danny is well known for blending neural and systems engineering to identify fundamental mechanisms of cognition and disease in human brain networks. They received a Bachelor's of Science in Physics from Penn State University and a PhD in Physics from the University of Cambridge as a Churchill Scholar and as an NIH Health Scientist. Uh, following a postdoctoral position at the UC Santa Barbara, Danny was Junior Research Fellow at the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind. They received multiple prestigious awards, including the APA Rising Star in 2012, the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow in 2014, MacArthur Fellow Genius Grant in 2014, and trust me, the list goes on, um, and has been named the Web of Science Most Highly Cited Researcher for three years running. Uh, Danny is the author of more than 300 peer-reviewed publications, which have garnered over 33,000 citations, as well as numerous book chapters and teaching materials. Danny's latest book, written with Perry Zern, uh, Curious Mind, lends directly to what we'll be talking about today and a topic that is, I think, intrinsically alive in those of you and you that are drawn to the scientific study. So most of you that are here today. Um, and I believe Danny will explore a new angle of what curiosity is and the power that it has to connect people and ideas. So with that, I'd like to pass it uh, over to Danny and I am very eager to hear what, what you will talk about. Thank you so much for the um, very, very kind introduction. I'm very excited to be with you all here today um, to talk about uh, Curious Minds. Uh, and so, yes, my book is, is coming out from MIT Press, should be on bookshelves on um, September 6th, um, but is available for pre-order now. Um, but what I'll focus on today is a particular slice of the work that's presented in the book. Um, I've called this talk, The Curious Human. And I want to start by asking the question of, of what curiosity is. So we know that the human mind uh, is curious in the sense that it is strange, it's remarkable and mystifying, it's eager, probing, and questioning. But despite the pervasiveness and relevance for our well being, curiosity remains relatively curious for us. In other words, far from understood. In this talk, I will integrate historical, philosophical, and psychological perspectives with techniques from applied mathematics and statistical physics to study individual and collective curiosity. In the former part, I will evaluate how humans walk on the knowledge network of Wikipedia during unconstrained browsing. And in doing so, we will capture idiosyncratic forms of curiosity that span multiple millennia, cultures, languages, and timescales. And then in, in the latter bit, when we study collective curiosity, I want to study that the fruition of collective curiosity in the building of scientific knowledge as encoded in Wikipedia. And throughout, I will make a case for the position that individual and collective curiosity are both network building processes, providing a connective counterpoint to the common acquisitional account of curiosity in humans. So let's ask again, what is curiosity? When I pronounce that term, several images might come to your mind. Perhaps you think of the classical board game Trivial Pursuit, which quickly takes you to the terrible trivium in the Phantom Tollbooth. Or perhaps you think of the two-year-old child asking an unending string of questions. Or maybe the beautiful sight of hands raised in a classroom. Perhaps curiosity is the love of trivia, and perhaps curiosity is the asking of questions, but can't we all think of curious individuals who do not enjoy playing Trivial Pursuit? Maybe they're curious in a different way. And can't we all think of curious individuals who do not verbalize many questions, perhaps because they are relatively shy or, and thoughtful? So what is curiosity then? And what makes a human curious? 
Well, the quandary of how to define curiosity, its places and its actions is not a challenge that we newly face. Uh, instead, it, is, it has been faced by many who have come before us. And here is just a sort of smattering of different definitions of curiosity uh, over the last 2000 years. So first, from Augustine in 397, we have that curiosity is a lust to experience and find out. Aquinas in 1270, curiosity is a desire to know. Or how about Descartes in 1649, curiosity is a desire to understand. John Locke in 1693 wrote that curiosity is an appetite after knowledge. William James in 1899, curiosity is the impulse toward better cognition. Or Dewey in 1933, uh, curiosity is an interest in problems provoked by the observations of things and the accumulation of material. Or Voss in 1983, curiosity is a motivational prerequisite of exploratory behavior. And then George Lowenstein in 1994, curiosity is a feeling of deprivation produced by information gaps. Finally, Nicole, or Nicole Kidd, uh, Celeste Kidd in 2015 wrote that curiosity is a drive state for information. So then what is it precisely of all, you know, from all of these definitions, what is it precisely that we are desirous of or impulsive towards or interested in or deprived of or driven towards? What is that object? Well, the answers, I think, knowledge, information, solutions to problems, better cognition are commonly thought of as items which when acquired are satisfying in some way. And in fact, this analogy between hunger and thirst and curiosity, as well as the analogy between food or drink and information, underscores, I think, for us, the acquisitional nature of our common conceptualizations of curiosity. Moreover, we think of curiosity as valuable to us because when we acquire the item of information, our life gets better. So our uncertainty about the world might be reduced, or perhaps we no longer feel deprived of information. So upon reflection, this acquisitional account of curiosity certainly seems and feels intuitive. Yet I think if we press the account and if we allow acquisitional actions of humans to kind of play out on the theater of human experience, we quickly come to realize that we're missing, I think, a, a key piece of the puzzle. An acquisition or a collection of informational bits does not constitute knowledge. Knowledge requires something more. Knowledge requires an understanding of the relation between bits of information. So relations of cause, of correlation, and of consequence, to name a few. So as Dewey writes, knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. An ideally perfect knowledge would represent such a network of interconnections that any past experience would offer a point of advantage from which to get at the problem presented in a new experience. So that's from Dewey. And now I want to also consider with you the perspective of Henri Poincaré. So he writes, the aim of science is not things themselves as the dogmatists in their simplicity imagine, but the relations among things. Outside these relations, there is no reality knowable. So with those two views in mind, I want to ask, how might we expand the current acquisitional account of curiosity to an explicitly connectional account of curiosity? And if we did so, what sorts of affordances might such an account offer? Well, the connectional account of curiosity casts curious humans as those that build networks networks of knowledge. They build by adding nodes and edges as they grow their body of knowledge. And we can use a more embodied description by saying that curious minds then engage in a kinesthetic practice. So by walking through knowledge spaces and picking up relations to structure their thought architectures. The knowledge network inside each mind is therefore constantly evolving and growing in manners and directions that are idiosyncratic. We each walk along the links that connect bits of information and then we'll stand at a particular void, maybe shout across and wonder, you know, what's on the other side of that void. 
With Walt Whitman, we might think a thought of the clef of the universe and of the future. When we find or discover a unit of information that fully or partially fills that void in front of us, then we have built a new bit of the scaffold in our knowledge network. In this framing, we can then ask, what is curiosity's walk? Is there just one or is there more than one? How are curiosity's walks similar or different? And which walk do we choose? To answer these questions, we worked with Professor Perry Zern, at, a philosopher at American University, who performed a historical philosophical examination of the use of the terms for curiosity in French, English, German, and Latin over the last two millennia. The method takes a common contemporary concept like curiosity or a common practice and traces its usage and meaning over one or several historical periods. From these data, Zern built a taxonomy of curiosity based on kinesthetic signatures, and he refers to them as the busybody, the hunter, and the dancer. We're gonna, we are going to walk through all three in a conceptual way first, and then I'll show you some science and data collection behind them. So the first kinesthetic signature of curiosity is the busybody. A good description comes from Plutarch in his On Curiosity, where he says, and the busybody, shunning the country as something stale and uninteresting and undramatic, pushes into the bar and the bazaar and the marketplace and the harbors asking, is there any news? A second example comes later from Martin Heidegger in his Being in Time, where he refers to curiosity as the not staying with what is nearest the distraction by new possibilities and the never dwelling anywhere. Interestingly, this kinesthetic signature suggests that the busybody enjoys building a knowledge of disconnected informational units. I'll take that little bit and I'll take that little bit and I'll take that little bit and I'll take that little bit, but they don't need to be related to one another. And I want to contrast that with the second kinesthetic signature, which Zern refers to as the hunter. Again, from Plutarch's On Curiosity, he says, if you have to be curious, I mean, please don't be, but if you have to be curious, don't turn aside and follow every scent, but keep your sense of smell pure and untainted for its proper task. And then from Friedrich Nietzsche in his uh, Beyond Good and Evil, the man of curiosity is described as wishing, quote, he had a few hundred helpers and good, well-trained hounds that he could drive into the history of the human soul to round up his game. And then finally from Jacques Derrida in The Animal That Therefore I Am, to be curious is to track, to sniff, to trail, and to follow some of the reasons for the so confident usage of words. So from these examples, the hunter is clearly curious but in a strikingly different manner than the busybody. Interestingly, this kinesthetic signature suggests that the hunter enjoys building a knowledge of connected informational bits. So I'll take this piece and I'll follow it to this piece and I'll track to this piece and I'll follow this trail over here, I'll sniff to this way, et cetera. So those are the first two, and we can contrast those two, the busybody and the hunter, with the third and final kinesthetic signature that Zern was able to extract from this historical philosophical um, examination. This third one is called the dancer. Again, from Nietzsche, but now in his gay science, thinkers of the future are envisioned thus. We do not belong to those who have ideas only among books or when stimulated by books. It is our habit to think outdoors, walking, leaping, climbing, dancing, preferably on lonely mountains or near the sea where even the trails become thoughtful. Our first questions about the value of a book, of a human being, or a musical composition are, can they walk even more? Can they dance? And from Michel Foucault in his The Masked Philosopher, we have, I can't help but dream about a kind of criticism that would try not to judge, but to bring an avoir, a book, a sentence, an idea to life. It would light fires, watch the grass grow, listen to the wind, and catch the sea foam in the breeze and scatter it. It would multiply not signs, or not judgments, but signs of existence. It would follow them, drag them from their sleep. Perhaps it would invent them, invent them sometimes, all the better. 
I'd like a criticism of scintillating leaps of the imagination. I dream of a new age of curiosity. So interestingly, this kinesthetic signature suggests that the dancer enjoys building a knowledge of connected clusters of informational units and leaps between them. So from each of these kinesthetic signatures or these walks uh, in a word space, we can note that perhaps going back to the beginning of the talk, curiosity is not what we are curious about, trivia or otherwise. And perhaps curiosity is not what physical actions we take. So raising a hand, for example. Instead, curiosity is how. It's how we build knowledge from concepts and their relations to one another. The busybody builds disconnected knowledge. The hunter builds orderly targeted knowledge. And the dancer complements local order with these long leaps into new conceptual spaces. So let us posit that as humans, as we move from book to book, or as scientists as we move from paper to paper, or as citizens as we move from web page to web page, we are building our knowledge networks. What sorts of networks do we build? And do our preferences differ between us? These questions amount to asking how we are curious and whether we are curious differently from one another. The work I will describe in the next few minutes was led by psychologist, Dr. David Lydon Staley, who's now a professor in the Annenberg School of Communication at Penn. So David began this study by inviting 149 human participants to browse Wikipedia for 20 minutes a day for 21 days. The participants signed a consent form allowing us to install software on their laptop to track which Wikipedia pages they viewed and when. Across the entire study, 18,654 pages were visited by each participant over five hours spanning 21 days. To build networks for their Wikipedia browsing, we represented each Wikipedia page as a node in the network. And then we represented each edge between Wikipedia pages as the cosine similarity, so bounded between zero and one, between all possible pairs of vectors of what's called term frequency inverse document frequencies associated with the text of each page. And that basically provides us with an assessment of the similarity in the textual content after accounting for very common words like a or the. So on the right, what I'm showing you is that we see an individual who browsed quite distinct pages that's here in the darker colors, the low similarity values. And then here on the right hand side, we see an individual who browsed pretty related pages. So these are the lighter colors and higher similarity values. And then in the middle, we see a third person who um, walked among Wikipedia pages that were you know, sometimes far away, sometimes uh, nearby. So now with these data, we are ready to assess network structure or the patterns of connections between concepts that people walk among. So we use tools from network science here, which is an emerging scientific discipline that studies the architecture, dynamics, design, and control of complex interconnected systems. It provides for us a toolbox, um, including analysis methods and um, statistical metrics that can be calculated and then compared. Translating the historical philosophical taxonomy into network types, we first hypothesize that a hunter will build networks with high clustering and low path length. And conversely, we hypothesize that busybodies will build networks with high path length and low clustering. So what does that mean? Well, first, the clustering coefficient measures the probability that a node's neighbors are also connected to each other. And it can be thought of as the proportion of connected triangles in the network. So intuitively then, someone whose network has high clustering would visit related Wikipedia pages. By contrast, the path length measures how many links need to be traversed to get from one node to another. So someone whose network has high path length would visit fairly unrelated Wikipedia pages. So using the clustering coefficient and the path length, we're able to translate the historical philosophical taxonomy into network phenotypes. And that in turn allows us to operationalize the kinesthetic signatures of curiosity 
in the parlance of network science. So to formalize the link to curiosity even a bit further, uh, we went one more step over here to uh, make a prediction about what features of participant personality might track with these particular phenotypes. So we hypothesize that individuals who are high in what's called deprivation sensitivity have a drive to eliminate the unknown as they encounter new information and recognize gaps in their knowledge. So therefore individuals high in deprivation sensitivity would be hunters in the um, historical philosophical parlance, uh, whereas um, individuals low in deprivation sensitivity would be the busybodies. So let's test these hypotheses in the Wikipedia browsing data. So first I'll note that the results certainly confirmed our hypotheses. We indeed found that deprivation sensitivity, which is what you see here along the um, X axis, uh, the, the tendency to seek information that eliminates knowledge gaps is associated with the creation of relatively tight networks and a relatively greater tendency to return to previously visited concepts. So here along the y-axis, you have the average clustering coefficient, and you can see that individuals who are high in deprivation sensitivity tend to build networks um, that, that fill in gaps nearby or holes nearby uh, in the knowledge network. Whereas here on the right-hand side, you see that individuals who are high in deprivation sensitivity build networks with low path length. And again, that means um, they're sort of denser, more connected uh, networks. So more simply then, individual differences in deprivation sensitivity lead to the creation of knowledge networks with really distinct architectures. So when we seek information, we seek it differently, constructing quite different networks of knowledge. But really interestingly, not only do we each seek information differently from one another, but we also seek information differently day by day. So to show you this, I'll note that we separated the data into early, middle, and late browsing. So early in the experiment, the middle part of the experiment, or the late part of the experiment. Um, and we also measured what's called sensation seeking as it varies from day to day. You can see the results here on the right hand side. So we found that the days of greater sensation seeking than normal are days in which the participants built more as busybodies than as hunters. So from these data, we can conclude that each day we are sort of differently curious than any other day. And then finally, we built a computational model of kinesthetic curiosity that generates walks on existing knowledge network architectures. And in that model, we sought to balance preferences to retrace the familiar versus explore the unfamiliar, and also preferences to take shorter versus longer steps on the network. And with these two parameters, the model can predict the architecture of networks that are built by people with really different kinesthetic uh, practices or preferences. Interestingly, we find that deprivation sensitivity is associated with retracing the familiar. So if you feel a lot of, if you're sensitive to the deprivation of information, you tend to retrace familiar steps inside of the network. Whereas um, subclinical levels of depression were associated with taking shorter steps on the network. Um, the links these links that I'm describing to you between sensation seeking and depression and kinesthetic actions in knowledge space, I think underscore the potential reflections of clinical factors in the way that we walk on networks. And collectively, both the data and the computational model serve to reconceptualize curiosity as an act of connecting rather than a method of acquiring information. Now, there are several open questions that remain that could guide some future work in this study that I want to go over before I turn to collective curiosity. Um, so first, as I noted earlier, George Lowenstein argues that curiosity is a feeling of deprivation produced by information gaps. So we can ask, do we see evidence of gaps actually forming and then being filled in as the networks are built? To answer that question, we are currently using tools from um, what's called applied algebraic topology. 
And this is guided by work from Dr. Ann Sizemore Blevins, who published a recent study during her time in the lab that reveals the growth of knowledge gaps in children as they learn language. But we can use those same approaches to identify gaps being formed and then filled in in the construction of the Wikipedia uh, networks as well. And then second, um, the information gap theory is not the only available theory for curiosity. There's another one that's called compression progress theory. And that theory posits that curiosity drives the seeking of information that increases the compressibility of the network. So we're curious in a way that will help us to compress the knowledge that we have. So we, that theory is really interesting, and we can ask the question, do we see evidence of growing compressibility as the networks are built? Um, to answer that question, we are currently using tools from information theory and statistical mechanics, guided by some work from Dr. Christopher Lin, whose paper on archive um, is actually now published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences. Uh, and that provides us with a formal method of um, calculating the compressibility of a network. With that method, we can now assess whether the uh, networks that are being built are increasing in compressibility. So with those um, future directions in mind, I now want to transition from the individual to the collective. So we know that humans are, are not only curious in the unitary, but also in the aggregate. And the fruition of collective curiosity is the network of scientific knowledge that Poincaré mentioned in the passage I had quoted earlier. So I mentioned Poincaré's passage to you, but I could have also used this one from Lauren Oaken's Elements of Physiophilosophy, which was first published in, in 1810. So he notes, science is a series of necessarily interdependent and consecutive propositions. So both Poincaré and Oaken, these two sort of scientist philosopher hybrids, uh, state frankly what we really intuitively appreciate, which is that we can't truly understand any item of knowledge until we understand its relations to other items of knowledge. And it's actually deciphering those relations that, that makes science what it is. So we want to understand how this happens. How do scientists do this kind of relation building? And if we think about the way that science happens, there have again been theories that have been uh, posited. In this case, they've frequently come from philosophy of science. So I wanna talk through a few of those um, theories and then show you how we can operationalize them in the context of network science and then test them explicitly in Wikipedia. So first, what are the theories? So <clears throat> in philosophy of science, philosophers have described patterns of scientific development in several ways. I'm going to talk about three today. First, Thomas Kuhn talks about having two regimes of science. The first is normal science, in which a quote unquote normal scientist simply solves puzzles within a paradigm. And then maybe you have a paradigm shift, which is a revolution in which the model of reality undergoes drastic change. For example, going from the geocentric to the heliocentric theory or from Newtonian physics to relativity. And science progresses in sort of back and forth between normal science and paradigm shifts. And we can contrast Kuhn's um, approach with one from Fire Robin, who proposed that science progresses as pure competition of ideas, and there's no characteristic pattern to scientific development. The third and final um, philosopher that I wanted to mention is Imri Lakatosh, who balanced the two ideas of Kuhn and Fire Robin by suggesting a research program which has a core set of postulates and then an auxiliary belt of hypotheses that build around that core. So here are three different theories. How can we empirically test these ideas? Well, what we do is that we turn to Wikipedia as a growing network of scientific knowledge, and we evaluate its time evolving architecture. We begin similarly to how we did in the first study by treating each page as a node in the network. And now we treat each hyperlink uh, as, an, as an edge that connects two nodes in the network. In order to understand how the network is growing, we need to have a date assigned to each node. 
And so we do that by examining the history section and extracting algorithmically, so in an automated manner, the first year in that section. That first year in the history section will be the date at which that concept um, or idea was developed. So using that method, we can create this very large concept network for different subfields of science. I'm showing you here chemistry um, and anatomy. I also want to note that in this formulation of knowledge, um, the concept networks that we study are, are um, not going to include uh, the commitments of the scientists, um, not, nor are they going to include the practices of the scientists, um, either scientific practices or social practices. Uh, rather, they're just historical networks of concepts and relationships between concepts. And I mention that because the ideas of Kuhn, Feyerabend, and Lakatos are partly about commitments and practices and partly about the development of concepts. What we're doing here is just focusing on that latter bit. Um, it's a lot harder to think about commitments and practices and extracting them in some algorithmic way. So that's just a kind of note on, on a limitation of the approach. Okay, so let's think about the three uh, theories that I described to you and how we could operationalize them in the context of network science. So in Kuhn's normal science, where scientists solve puzzles within a paradigm, one could see the new concepts connect different parts of the network together. And so in network terms, you might see high clustering of nodes, which is what I'm showing you here. In Lakatosh's research program, by contrast, he describes science as having a core of postulates and then an auxiliary belt of, um, of hypotheses. So in this case, you might see core periphery structure in the network. And then lastly, in Feyerabend's thesis, there is no characteristic pattern to science. So perhaps we would see more of a random network structure between the network concepts. So let's look at the Wikipedia data and ask, do we see high clustering? Do we see more core periphery structure? Or do we see relatively random structure? So here's the data. Um, along the y-axis here is the real value of um, the Wikipedia concept networks. Along the x-axis is data from an Esri wired null model. The dashed line is the unity line. And so what I want you to focus on is just whether the data points are above or below the unity line. So here you see that the clustering coefficient is much higher in the real networks than it is in the edge rewired null models. What does that mean? That means that Wikipedia concept networks have high clustering consistent with Kuhn's um, approach or suggestion, our operationalization of Kuhn's suggestion, I should say. In the middle here, you see the modularity of the network, which is a quantification of whether the edges are being um, densely located inside of specific communities or clusters with relatively sparse connectivity between clusters. And again, I want you to focus just on whether the data points are above or below the unity line. What you see is that most of the data points are above the unity line. And what that means is that the real networks have higher modularity than expected in edge rewired uh, null model networks. And then finally, we tested for core periphery structure. So we have a measure of coreness, so whether the network has a dense core and then a periphery of concepts. And what you can see is that these um, concept networks tend to have higher coreness than expected in the edge rewired null model, so consistent with Lakatosh's um, suggestion. All three of these uh, data um, all three of these um, figures illustrate the clear non-random organization of the concept networks in Wikipedia, and that suggests that we need something beyond Fire Robin's description of this sort of no characteristic structure to um, the scientific development. There must be more, there must be some other constraint on what's happening here. Um, so now I think we can consider the constraint that Lakatosh proposed, which is that the periphery builds on the core. So first you have a core and then you have a periphery that builds upon it. So in the data we can ask, is the core born earlier than the periphery in each of these concept networks? Yes or no. So what am I showing you here? Along the top here, you see the different fields. 
um, of science or mathematics. And then along the y-axis here, you see um, whether the core was born earlier by uh, some period or uh, the periphery was born earlier by some period. What I want you to notice is that all of these violin plots have a high density at the zero mark, the zero line. And what that means is that in general, the core nodes are not born before or after their neighboring peripheral nodes. They're born, um, they're both, some are born early, some are born late. Um, sometimes the periphery is born first, sometimes the core is born first. So this suggests that, again, some additional constraint is needed to explain um, the process of scientific development here. So where does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us with the idea that science concept networks are definitely clustered and they're definitely modular, not random. So uh, that's not con consistent with our operationalization of Fire Robin's approach. Uh, they do have cores and peripheries consistent with Lakatos, but they don't have the core born before the periphery. They simultaneously grow outward from the, to the periphery and inward to fill in the core. So there's a consistent outward and inward development of scientific ideas. So that leaves Kuhn. Um, could Kuhn be right? Is normal science a process of puzzle solving or of filling in knowledge gaps? Well, let's look specifically at the knowledge gaps using those approaches from applied algebraic topology that I mentioned earlier. To study these gaps um, or cavities, we can use what's called persistent homology. Uh, and that's a method from applied algebraic topology. Persistent homology generalizes this notion of gaps into n dimensions. And I'm showing you some examples here at the top. So a zero dimensional um, gap would be between two disconnected nodes. And then a node that connects those two nodes would fill that gap. A one dimensional uh, a uh, gap would look like this square, and it could be filled in by a node that connects to all four corners of the network. And then over here on the right-hand side, you can see a two-dimensional cavity, where if a node is placed in the center and connected to all of those nodes, then it would fill that gap. So what we do in the data is that we look for zero-dimensional, one-dimensional, and two-dimensional gaps, and we ask whether they are growing or um, and, and then being filled and when. So in the data, what we see is the cumulative frequency of the lifetimes of gaps in real versus null model networks. And we can also see the cumulative frequency of gaps that are still open. So here's the number of present cavities. Those are the ones that are still open. And here um, are the, the actual uh, lifetimes. So note that the null networks have the same number of nodes uh, for the edge rewired null model and also the same number of edges. So these are important comparators. What we see from the data is that the scientific concept networks have shorter lifetime gaps than the null networks. And they also have fewer open gaps than the rewired null networks. So that means that there are, they're not uh, um, alive for as long and there are fewer of them. So do we see evidence of normal science or a filling in of knowledge gaps? Yes, that's definitely what we see in comparison to these null model networks. So real networks both fill in gaps faster and create fewer gaps than the random null networks. But you could ask the question of, of why. It, why would that, would that be useful for us? Why may we as scientists do that? Um, and we can try to address the question of why by considering whether and how these particular um, discoveries have been valued or influential in science. And we do that by considering Nobel Prizes. I also want to note here that we recognize that um, there are that Nobel Prizes are not the only measure of, of influence um, of a scientific idea and are certainly not um, an unbiased assessment necessarily. Nevertheless, we did study them. So what we do is that we measure no, whether Nobel Prizes tend to be given for concepts that either start a gap or close a gap. 
And on the left-hand side, what we're seeing is that Nobel Prize winning nodes are more likely to participate in a simplex in which a gap is birthed than non-Nobel Prize winning nodes. And on the right-hand side, what we find is that Nobel Prize winning nodes are more likely to participate in a simplex in which a gap is filled than non-Nobel Prize winning nodes. So together, these two data points um, suggest that influential nodes are those that more frequently participate in either the birth of a gap or cavity or the death of a gap or cavity. So let's conclude then. What have we learned in this study of collective curiosity? In a network formulation of scientific discovery, data-driven conditions underlying breakthroughs depend just as much on identifying uncharted gaps as on advancing solutions within scientific communities. And that's what we saw in the um, development of both the periphery and the core. More specifically, the findings reveal that human knowledge grows by filling gaps in knowledge, perhaps driven by the collective curiosity of individual scientists, but through inward and outward exploration and gradual modifications of the network structure. Moreover, knowledge discovered while creating and filling knowledge gaps is likely to be more influential and more frequently awarded in the scientific community. The mathematical formulations of historical data that I just showed you, I think uh, pave the way to better describe and understand scientific progress, and importantly, offer a data-driven approach to identify novel contributions. Of course, several open questions remain still. So first, do our conclusions hold if we examine non-English Wikipedia? So everything I showed you today was just on English Wikipedia. But to answer this question of whether it would hold, um, we can talk to the Wikimedia Foundation, which we actually are in conversation with now, to gain more understanding of the structure of Wikipedia across languages. And then secondly, we can ask, is there a shared principle evident in the way that knowledge grows and the way that we teach knowledge to others? And to answer this question, we could use tools from natural language processing, perhaps guided by this recent work from Nico Christensen, um, who studied the architecture of knowledge in college level mathematic te mathematics texts. And I would really like to know whether the um, architecture of a mathematics text is similar to what we see um, in the structure of, of global knowledge as evidence in Wikipedia. And then third and finally, we can ask what factors allow for the architecture of networks to reconfigure during paradigm shifts or conceptual leaps. And to answer that question, we're using some interesting work from Jason Kim that was recently published, um, understanding the conformational change of network structures. And we're examining conformational change in knowledge networks in addition to um, sort of physical networks as well. So with that, let's just summarize um, the two studies together. So first, I noted for you all the individual and collective curiosity are network building processes, and those processes can be informed by historical philosophical examination of the use of terms for curiosity in English, French, German, and Latin over the last two millennia. I then showed you that curiosity archetypes are evident in the ways that humans browse Wikipedia and curious movements are evident in the ways that humans build scientific knowledge. Together, these two studies provide a connective counterpoint to the common acquisitional account of curiosity in humans. With that, I'd like to acknowledge um, the team who, was, uh, who contributed to the work. So in addition to my um, lab members, I wanted in particular to highlight David Leiden Staley, Perry Zern, Dale, and Anne for part one, the um, individual curiosity. And then I wanted to note Hrong Zhu, uh, Judy Kaplan, who's a historian of science, and Julio Tuma, who's a philosopher of science, who contributed to the study of collective curiosity. So with that, thank you so much for listening. And I would love to take questions at this stage. Thank you very much, Danny, for that. Uh, very enlightening uh, and lives up to well, well beyond my expectations. <laughs> uh, there are a few Q and A's. Uh, questions already posted in the Q and A, uh, so maybe we'll start there. And then, uh, if anyone else has any additional questions, please start populating them in my Q and A. So uh, we have the first question from Johanna Steeler. 
Uh, how do you ensure that the information seeking that individuals show actually reflects curiosity rather than boredom? And what do you think are the links and differences between curiosity and boredom since they both can drive information seeking behavior? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that with the current um, version of the experiment, we can't detect whether somebody is moving from page to page. Um, I, I mean, in in a, and are bored by all of them, <laughs> or if they're engaging and are excited about all of them. So one way to change or to, to detect whether boredom is part of this information seeking behavior is to ask them. Um, whether they are moving from one page to another page because they're bored uh, or ask them their level of boredom. So in our current experiment, we don't have that question. However, it is something that we've considered adding to just have sort of a pop-up when somebody moves from a page to another page and ask, why are you moving? Are you moving because you need, want more information about this or are you moving because you're bored? Um, or maybe another uh, option. So something really quick where they could just click one of three possibilities. So that's, I think, what would be needed. Um, my, however, my sense is that the, you can see <laughs> from the data very clearly that people have interests, I think, um, and that they're walking among pages that are connected in interesting ways. So for example, there's one person who was um, consistently going to pages about the royal family uh, in England, and that's that. And it's very clear that there was there was a theme to to the pages that they were going to. Another person um, spent a lot of time in Jewish history, so I think I think it's something that you can detect in a um, in an informal sense just by looking at what people are are moving between. But I think if you wanted something formal, you would need to ask them. Good question. Okay, and we have a live question from Ed Vessel. Uh, so that will. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Danny, great talk. Um, I um, was curious just to ask a question about, so you mentioned network compressibility as kind of an area that you're looking into as kind of a potential uh, extension and, and way of understanding, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a why or exactly what curiosity is doing. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm curious. So, so um, how do you how do you think about how this relates to higher order relations? I mean, you know, so you're, you're talking about nodes in the network, but of course we know that information and facts um, are not all created equal. And I, and I think this also relates to your conceptualization of your theory as kind of different from an acquisitional uh, theory, because you know um, I think you know any acquisitional theory would also recognize that some types of facts are more important than others. And I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, so how do you, is, is this idea of network compressibility related to kind of the formation of a new concept that more succinctly explains a set of facts? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so yes, the, here's, here's a paper that, um, we have on archive that addresses the compressibility of those Wikipedia networks um, and shows that, that the compression progress theory is a partial but not perfect explanation for what's going on. But to answer your question, um, so that's like really practical if you wanna see how we did it. But to answer your question, I think, yes, the compressibility idea is a network is going to be very compressible if it has completely dense modules. So if you have one module that's completely dense, every concept is connected to every other one, then you could collapse that into one node um, or in, in the parlance of what you're, the words you're using, it would be one idea or one concept that is, that is sort of a distillation of that whole space um, that would make the network more compressible. So um, it does motivate a question of the hierarchical nature of the structures that people are building. We didn't explicitly though use um, t higher order connections, ex ex well, it, in the um, very formal mathematical sense. These are still um, pairwise connections. Does that help? Yeah, I think I think um, yes, that makes sense. Um, 
And I have another question, but I'll wait and let other people go first. Okay, so there's another uh, question in the Q&A uh, from Isabel Schnorr. Uh, how did you measure participants' deprivation? I think that's in reference to one of the studies that you showed earlier. Yeah, so there is a, um, a there are several curiosity um, scales that are available in the literature. Um, one is from Todd Cashton. Another one is, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the person's name. I'll find it and put it in the, in the um, chat. Um, and so there are, it's a set of questions that people answer. And then from that, you get um, a measurement of how, how high they are on deprivation sensitivity. These are scales that have been carefully developed um, and tested over multiple different um, participant groups um, to ensure that they are um, ha have high reliability. Okay, and the next question is, is the pattern of info seeking trainable? And that's from Irina Scaliora. Is it trainable? Um, that's not something that it, we assessed in any of our studies. However, it is very intuitive that it is trainable. I mean, I think that that's part of what one does when one goes to school um, and, and definitely what one does when one does a PhD, for example. You know, you're being trained in a particular kind of information seeking um, and information structuring. So I think it is it is trainable, um, or at least that's my intuitive sense. But it's not something that we have addressed formally. And from Urban Achiro, uh, is there the same concept of growing compressibility of the network for different kinesthetic signatures of curiosity? From what I got, it also seems that individuals with a busy body signature go from an expansion of the network before looking for relation and connection whereas hunters would look uh, for this compression of a network as it is formed. Yeah, it, your intuition ex is exactly right. So the busybody should not have a very compressible network, um, whereas the hunter should have a, a more compressible network as you go. And from Vera Lau, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. I am wondering how you see the curious mind relating to both its own materiality as well as material agents in the outer world inducing curiosity. Also, I would be interested in how you think the structuring of Wikipedia itself, as well as the participants' previous learning of how to interact with the Wikipedia example, that it is possible to click on hyperlinks to get more information, and that this is faster than searching for non-hyperlink terms, uh, shapes their research paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, materiality is not something that we, uh, that relates a little bit to my comments about commitments and practices in the second part of the talk, um, that it's very difficult to assess pra scientific practices, which would be material, like I'm going to, you know, pick up this instrument and use it to get this piece of information. Um, that's not something that we can draw from Wikipedia. So I, I, I feel like to, um, to connect more to the materiality of our engagements, we need a different um, experimental approach. So I'd be happy to talk about those ideas, you know, in a conceptual way, um, but not, I don't think it's something that's very easy to do with scientifically with the two studies that I just described. Um, and that is a limitation, I think. The second question that you have about learning how to interact with P Wikipedia, so using hyperlinks versus non-hyperlinks, is so interesting. There, and, and I think it opens for me the broader question of what are the limitations of Wikipedia itself, and is this a consistent, is it, you know, an a, a objective, um, unbiased uh, description of, of what information is out there? And the answer is definitely no. So there are many papers that have been published showing that there are gaps in Wikipedia content. So um, for example, there are fewer pages dedicated to um, women scholars than to men scholars, more so than you would expect given the numbers of such scholars in the field. So that's one example. There's another example where the um, pages that are for women scholars are shorter um, on average than the ones that are for men scholars, again, more so than you would expect um, given the um, 
given the careers of those individuals. So there's all kinds of interesting um, biases that are present in that structure as a data set. And you're raising a different one, which is that there are some ideas that are hyperlinked and other ideas that are not hyperlinked. Well, who put the hyperlink there? And what makes it, you know, do we have any evidence that that's an objective? All the ones that should be hyperlinked are hyperlinked <laughs> versus not, you know. Um, so all of this is just to say that I think it's a really interesting and probably our best test case, but it is not a perfect test case. And there are int very interesting questions about how the structure of Wikipedia itself, its content and its organization in terms of hyperlinks could be influencing the ways that people are browsing. Um, and I think one way of addressing that is perhaps by going to the Wikipedia in different languages. And it's possible that there are enough differences there that we could say, you know, how much of what we are seeing is due to just human curiosity and how much of it is influenced by um, content or structure of Wikipedia as kind of a test system. And uh, I think we'll go to Lucia now, who uh, has a question. Hey, Danny. Um, thank you for this wonderful talk. You know, it was really, you know, like thank you very stimulating. Oh, well, you know, like it's our pleasure. You know, so thank you, thank you. I have a couple, it's not a well-formulated question in some sense, but you know, what I'm trying to, what I always wonder about how we create knowledge is how conservative we are. So in the sense of you know like how much when you call when you when you think about and you, you close a knowledge gap is that we're trying we're trying to fill a confirmation you know in some sense you know um, and as we know in a lot a lot of the you know radical paradigm shifts in science have been taboo at some point so it's something that people you know we don't really want them right so we are curious in a very narrow sense. We want to learn a lot about what we want to learn and not necessarily about what is really out there. So do you have any evidence of that in, in your, um, you know, through your network science? And, and if you don't, how could you, how could one measure that in the sense like how real explorers are we and how much we really want to challenge ourselves as opposed to just seek for what we want? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, it's something that has come up a little bit in the conversations with the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I think there's a, an, you know, interesting question of when and how misinformation is present or how, um, you know, where conspiracy theories may be propagated um, and um, where people may just be following what they already know they're interested in. Um, I don't, and I think that that's really, really very important to study. It's not something that we've addressed in either of these studies. Um, yeah, in particular, I think what would be really interesting is to ask people why they stayed in particular spaces. So this person who's, who um, was really interested in the royal family, you know, how much did they already know about the royal family? Why, and, and what was the motivation to be searching. Um, it's, but even if we ask that sort of question, it's difficult to quantify the answers. Um, so I'm still a bit stumped on scientifically how you would do that in a, in a really rigorous way. The person who comes to mind who I think would be, would have great ideas for how to do this is, um, is Carl Bergstrom um, from the University of Washington, who does a lot of work in in uh, in information and and sort of the structure structures of knowledge, I think it, he would probably have some good ideas here. Yeah, it's a really good question and just not something that we um, have been able to address in these studies. Because it seems what is curious about how how we are curious is that it seems that we live in informational bubbles in some sense. So we we try to explore it, but within a very you know bounded space, right? Um, and, and I would actually be super curious about how science, and that's why you know, I love your, the, the paper that's still in, 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 in the archive, you know, because it's, it, it, in, in some sense, you know, one can think about like, how can we also push ourselves as scientists to explore those spaces, you know, beyond, you know, like, so to, to kind of like, you know, because now we have those tools, right? So 
you know, in our human mind, we, we know, like and Danny Kahneman has told us that you know, we have this bias to, you know, for confirmation. Yes. But perhaps with your tools, we can literally push ourselves to explore further, you know, in, yes. in uncomfortable places. So I'm, I'm super yeah. excited about that aspect. Yeah, yeah, I really, I'm, I'm excited about that too. I mean, and I definitely think that that's something that, that is worth doing for ourselves, just, just in general, to sort of go to the, the meetings that we, you know, are not directly in our, in our area, or the mini symposium at the conference that's not directly related to our work, or reading books that aren't, I, you know, directly in the space of where we are currently working. I think that that's, that's where I often get, I think the, the ideas that I'm most excited about is when I have been browsing somewhere else far away from, you know, what I should be doing. Um, but maybe I should be doing that, because that's, that's definitely where some of the more interesting ideas come from, I think. Thank you so much. This was really, really, really beautiful. Thanks. A beautiful idea, not only a curious idea, but a beautiful idea. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I think we'll jump go back to Ed. He had another question. Uh, and Ed, I'll let you, you go ahead and, and say it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I typed it into the Q&A too. Um, so I'll just read it from there. Um, the explanation you gave of Kuhn's ideas as clustering seemed to me to be missing the paradigm shift part. Um, and so, you know, you kind of characterize it as kind of normal science, but of course the paradigm shift is kind of the break from normal science, right, in a way. Um, so you, you briefly mentioned that you're looking into confirmational change as kind of a reflection of that. And I just would be interested to hear a bit more about what reorganization or, or uh, you know, what kinds of changes in a network structure or reorganization would a paradigm shift look like? Yeah. Um, so the way that we are thinking about it right now is that um, the, the networks that exist in our mind could be relatively sparse, particularly in new spaces that we don't know a lot about, um, and that we may be embedding them in relatively low dimensional spaces because that's cost efficient um, for our minds. So you could imagine that you have a relatively sparse network that's embedded in a low dimensional space, um, but then you have a new node that comes in and connects to, to a piece over here and a piece way over here um, and brings those together for the first time that pulls the network into a different um, uh, shape that it, it was that it didn't have before and um that change in shape is is the is the confirmation so it alters but none of the other connections have changed they can all be the same length they can all be the same size they can all be the same strength but there's a, there's enough sparsity in the network that it can actually reconfigure and bring these two uh close by to one another you would see that evidenced in alterations in the um dimension of the embedding of the network. So, because this has like pulled you into another dimension. I don't know if that, that's a very technical answer to your question. <laughs> I don't know if that was what you were asking. That was great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, we have a couple more in the Q&A. Uh, so from Wei Xiao, a great speech. My question is, does the structure of knowledge affect curiosity? For example, the curiosity about the theory of music and the curiosity about how to play a song on a piano is the same or uh, they are different by nature. Um, that's a good question. I don't think that we know yet um, whether right now this theory does not require us to know anything about the content space that people are curious about. So whether they're curious in um, music or whether they're curious in mathematics or something else, all we care about or all we are assessing is whether they are curious in a way that follows tracks or that is, is, is a little bit more haphazard or this dancer phenotype um, that's related more to the conformational change idea. Uh, and we, I could imagine, we do imagine that and see that those curiosity phenotypes are present in people who have very, very different interests. So I guess I would see the, um, I would see that the assessment of connectional structures as being independent of the content space that somebody is working in.
Thank you. And the last question here is from Zainat Bunitz. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. In these studies mentioned, were individuals with OCD or autism excluded? What are the whys of curiosity in your opinion? And do you think the anxiety driven to relieve anxiety and dopamine driven curiosity as in knowledge to gain pleasure should not be studied separately? There's a couple of questions kind of embedded in there. So. Yeah. Um, so we do not have people um, with OCD and autism in the first study, first of all. Um, and then what are the whys of curiosity in your opinion? Well, I don't know. I mean, so there are there are lots of ways of answering why the why question. Um, so one is the information gap theory versus the compression progress theory versus our conformational change theory. So that is what what is it that people get from constructing knowledge in this way? Do they do they, do they feel satisfied by having the gap filled? Do they feel satisfied by having more compressed um, information? Uh, is it important to have the flexible architecture in their minds that the conformational change would allow? Um, but then there's this, the, the separate bit of um, the why of, well, I'm just really interested in mathematics. So I'm curious because I'm, I really love that space, right? And it's more of a content specific why, answer to the why question. So I, I guess I would say that there are lots of different sorts of answers to the why question and we might need to be more specific about what whys we care about with the answers we probably care about all of them um but but um answering them is going to take different approaches and then do i think that the anxiety driven and dopamine driven curiosity as in uh should be studied separately um I mean, certainly if you have access to information about um, the affect of individuals while they are browsing, then that makes a lot of sense um, to separate them out. I think um, it would be very interesting to ask how those two um, may or may not be related to the kinesthetic signatures that we see. So the deprivation sensitivity is tracking with the um, construction of more clustered versus less clustered networks. So that um, you know, is not an explicit anxiety assessment, um, but it is something that is, is certainly uh, conceptually connected. We didn't ask them about the, well, that's not true. We also have a measure that's called joyous um, exploration. And that one did not as strongly correlate with the phenotypes that we observed. So that is interesting. Hmm, I'm like thinking through the data in light of your question on the spot here. I think yeah, I think it would be interesting to dig into those potential differences further. I think that our particular data set only had 149 individuals. And so um, it's difficult with that number to see some of these relationships. And I think with a broader study, it would be exciting to separate those two out more. Great idea. That is all the questions that came forth uh, for today, which was uh, very good to hear you uh, answer all of them. So thank you, Danny. Um, and I guess just to conclude for today is that uh, thank you again, Danny, for, for sharing this body of work. And I'm most familiar with your work on neural networks. Uh, and it was really quite incredible to see some of the concepts there traverse this topic and, and how multidisciplinary you really are. So um, thank you. And uh, just to mention to everyone else here is that the next Mind Voyage lecture will be on Thursday, June 30th uh, at the same time. And that will be featuring Romain Brett and he'll be talking about uh, what is information for an organi organism. Uh, so we hope to see you all there. And before I let you go, I'll pass it over to Lucia who may have some final remarks. 
Just one quick announcement. Tanya put the upcoming book of Danny on the chat. Go get it. <laughs> That's it. And thank you so much, Danny, for being today with us. It was a real pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.